Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for coming to the session. My name is Jenny, and I'll be your moderator today. A few quick reminders. Um, some of you will probably know if you already joined the earlier sessions, but conference sessions are recorded and available on Hubelo through the end of October and on the CSHA website after that. Slides will be shared after the conference. Please feel free to enter any questions you may have um, for the Q&A session in the Q&A box and also the chat box. Um, we are collecting evaluations for each day. Links will be sent to you via email and also on the conference feed, complete and evaluation to be included in the raffle each day. So joining us are wellness and prevention coordinators from Roseville Joint Union High, Christina, Craig, and Sabrina. Please welcome them. Thank you, Jenny, and good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us on this virtual platform of our presentation. We want a wellness center, and we want it now. Uh, a little spin off of uh, a little Veruca Salt and, and, and Willy Wonka there for you. Um, sorry. Um, so today we're going to cover a bunch of stuff uh, really around our journey of um, how we came to land on the wellness center concept for our district how we're embedding it within our multi-tiered system of support, um, the collaboration aspect, using evidence-based practices and a trauma-informed approach, um, how teaming works um, and uh, response to intervention and our intervention response team, building capacity, how do we do this and build capacity with this program, um, how do we fund it, and then uh, evaluating our program to make sure that the work we're doing is effective. Um, so we're gonna introduce ourselves next. Um, my name is Christina Devon Claveau. Uh, I am uh, one, of the, one, one of the three wellness and prevention coordinators in the Roseville Joint Union High School District. Um, I hail from the great state of Minnesota. I've been a school social worker. This is my 15th year. Um, although um, I have fallen in love with Northern California and my family and I are never going back. Um, I've held a few different positions since moving to to this area in 2013 um, and this is our third year of implementing wellness centers in Roseville Joint. Good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Craig Gibbs um, and I'll be presenting after Sabrina. Uh, my experience um, has happened over 20 years. I've been involved with child abuse investigations early on in my career um, and then working with schools. Um, I also did ERMS work um, for a school district in Southern California um, and also helped them start a juvenile drug court program. <clears throat> Worked at the county level, um, coordinating foster and homeless programs um, and doing some training around school-based wraparound um, and then doing statewide training um, called Eliminating Barriers to Learning. Um, and for the last three years, I've been working with Roseville Joint to help them implement their um, wellness centers. And it's been a great journey. Hi, and good morning, everybody. My name is Sabrina Vela. Um, I have been working in schools since um, about 2006, um, but starting in 2008, I started to focus my work in schools, working with mental health supports, specifically with children and adolescents. Um, those of you from the Bay Area, I worked for 10 years for the nonprofit Seneca family of agencies out there. And I like to tell people that I started at kind of the most extreme, high risk, high need students in the state of California worked in a non-public school, locked residential treatment facility, um, and kind of worked in various capacities with Seneca in schools, doing ERMS work, working in counseling in rich classrooms. Um, I was out at Hayward High School for four years working in their wellness center and setting up their cost system um, and also have a little bit of experience working in locked residential treatment facilities um, out in Alameda County and doing various work out in the Bay Area. But I am very excited to be now with Roseville Joint Union High School District and kind of share um, kind of my role in this journey with wellness centers. All right, so uh, we're just going to start out by letting you know a little bit about who we are um, and where we are out in Roseville Joint. Uh, Roseville is a suburb of Sacramento. We're about 30 miles east of uh, east of Sacramento, uh, and Roseville is a really growing uh, growing community. We have. Um, uh, a large, um, we have, we're about 10,000 students. And like I said, we are a high school district. We, um, we are made up of six comprehensive high schools. Our sixth one, uh, West Park, just opened um, uh, in August of, 20, of 2020. So it's a brand new school waiting to get filled with students. Um, 
our schools are all in Placer County except for um, a uh, Antelope High School that is a Placer County, uh, Placer County Office of Ed school um, with us but is um, located in uh, Sacramento County. We also have two um, alternative high schools, um, our Adelante and Independence, and we have also a very successful adult school program within our district. Um, the mission of our school district is ignite, innovate, um, and meaningful learning, uh, inspire powerful impact in our communities, and prepare all students for multiple paths to success. Um, we are uh, mostly um, a Caucasian, pop we have mostly a Caucasian population with our Hispanic and Latino population coming in at about 23%. Um, <clears throat> and then um, mixing with uh, multi-ethnic and uh, African-American, Filipino um, and um, Native American as um, smaller subpopulations. Um, these are our free and reduced lunch numbers from 2019-2020, as I'm sure if there's other schools on this on this training this morning, um, we haven't really gathered really accurate data because of we are in full distance learning at the moment. Um, so last year we were about 26%, but just so you understand kind of the diverse socioeconomic um, uh, situations of our families mm -hmm. here in Roseville Joint. Um, Granite Bay had um, last year had 11% free and reduced lunch. Um, so it's a more affluent population um, uh, at our Gr Granite Bay High School, but and then Antelope had about 54% um, uh, free re reduced lunch. So you can see there we have some um, a pretty large um, diverse socioeconomic status population. So um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time telling you about the history of our mental health services um, in Roseville Joint. Um, starting in 2015-2016, um, we um, contracted with an outside provider who just provided tier three individual therapy to our students. And how that worked was the referral process was a student was reporting um, social emotional issues or maybe even behavioral issues on campus. Um, it went to an admin and then those referrals had to come from the counselor and this outside provider um, uh, provided just individual services to those students, just provided 10 sessions. And um, they could only carry a caseload of 10 students per school site. So as you can imagine, we had uh, with a student population of about 10,000 and growing, and we had a pretty long line um, of students waiting to get um, these supports and services on campus. What I can tell you um, in doing research for our program is that we also know um, new, we are a PBIS school, positive behavior interventions and supports. And we also knew that we had a gaping hole in our tier two services. We were not, we did not offer very many, if at all, any tier two services on our campuses. The other data that we looked at was our California Healthy Kids Survey, and we looked at two questions. The one addressing um, hopeless or uh, feelings of um, sadness in the last 12 months, um, and also um, having uh, seriously considered attempting suicide. And those numbers from uh, the previous time, so we take this survey every two years, um, from 2015 had, had continued to climb and continue to grow. Um, so we knew we, we still had a lot of work to do. We also knew like many of, um, like many other areas that when a student was struggling, there was a pretty long wait time for them to be able to see a mental health provider in the community. Sutter and Kaiser are our large, um, our large mental health providers here in our community. Um, and there was a pretty long wait, wait period for um, students to be able to get in um, and, see, and see an outside provider. <clears throat> So um, with looking at all of this information, uh, we went to our boss, Craig was um, just new with Roseville Joint, and we decided to, um, to do some research. And what we landed on is wellness centers. And wellness centers are not a new concept out there. Um, Craig and I spent about eight weeks doing research, um, going to visit different wellness centers um, in the Bay Area. And we're gonna talk a little bit about those sites that we saw who are real pioneers um, up, uh, we think um, up in our area with providing mental health, school-based mental health services to their campuses. So we spent a lot of time visiting, talking to people, um, gathering resources, doing our own research, um, and then planning to bring our, um, our information to um, our cabinet. 
So um, in full transparency, our cabinet at that time was, was made up of um, six, um, six old white guys uh, that um, didn't know much about mental health and social emotional supports on, uh, on campuses. So it kind of felt like walking in um, and asking dad for, um, for something. And so that's why this image stood out to me because uh, we went and asked and asked for these wellness centers and um, gave data and reason as to why we think this would be a, a good model for our district. Um, so just a little humor there. That's what it felt like walking into this meeting um, with our cabinet members. What we were asking for was two. We wanted to pilot wellness centers at two of our high schools. The response that we got was no. Why just do two when all seven at the time of our high schools need this support? So there's a little Danny DeVito um, humor for you. So then it really felt like being um, a, in one of Oprah Winfrey's um, episodes of her favorite things at Christmas time. You get a wellness center and you get a wellness center. Um, so that's, that was you know, how that meeting went. And so we decided that we needed to go to work. Um, and so the first thing that we did was uh, put together a wellness implementation team. And that was, uh, that was made up of different stakeholders that were already doing some, uh, some version of social, social emotional supports on our campuses. Um, so this was made up of um, district leadership, school site administration, our learning support specialist, which is a unique position to our district. Um, they support students with attendance and academic needs on our campuses. Um, we had a nurse on our team, uh, members from special education, um, our school site counselors, and um, our new roles um, being transitioned. I was a PBIS coordinator when I first started in this district, um, and Craig was doing some contract work, and we were being transitioned into our, this wellness coordinator position. Um, so we went and toured um, some wellness centers that, in our opinion, were doing really great work. Um, shout out to Tamil Pius Union High School District. Je Jessica Colvin is the, um, the um, coordinator there. And uh, she's doing great work in, in those districts and is actually um, starting to um, do some consulting work around helping a school set up, um, set up wellness center. So Jessica was a great resource to us. We then went to Gunn and Palo Alto High School um, and they are doing amazing work there. They were about five years um, at, sorry, at the time they were about two years implemented um, wellness centers and doing really cool things for their students. Um, and then we went mm -hmm. to the OG, we went to Mission High School in San Francisco and they've had a wellness center since 2002. And so we really wanted to get a spectrum of, uh, see a spectrum and um, of wellness centers and how they're being implemented and how long um, to just give us a good snapshot of what we needed. So we're really grateful to these schools for letting us um, crash, uh, uh, crash their schools and get tours and get gather information from them. Um, so we decided based on data that um, our next step uh, moving forward was to what are we going to focus on within wellness. We knew we wanted to provide um, comprehensive, flexible um, services to students and not just focus on mental health. Uh, but also um, tackle substance use prevention. And Craig and Sabrina are gonna talk a little later about what that looks like. Um, attendance support, attendance. We know that attendance is a symptom of something else. Uh, so we wanted to be able to support those students who are having those barriers. We wanted to do thorough assessments and referrals that drove our evidence-based practices. And we can't do this work alone. So we really wanted to collaborate with our community partners uh, and county partners to be able to best serve our students and families. So I'm gonna pass this on to Sabrina, who's gonna go into our more of our programming and our interventions. Thank you, Christina. Um, so they set a lot of the groundwork with regards to research and seeing what was best practices out there um, and what is going on in the state of California with wellness centers. Um, and they brought me on board for the beginning of the 2018-2019 school year when we started to bring on the staff and started to open up our services and our doors for our um, school district wellness centers. 
Um, we did not want to be a program that was a standalone program and work in isolation. We wanted to partner with systems that were already established um, throughout the school district so that we were integrating at all three tiers, tier one, tier two, tier three. Um, and I'm going to go into what that looked like for our program. And like Christina mentioned before, PBIS was already established. It was an already well integrated system at each of our schools throughout our district. And so we started to establish partnership with stakeholders at our sites um, in each of these areas so that we were um, partnering and doing integration from the inside out. We set up a model of integration at all three tiers. Mm -hmm. Tier one is the whole school is receiving intervention and services. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that looked like over the past couple of years and it's expanded, but it included things like um, awareness months, suicide prevention month this September every single year um, and classroom push-ins. Tier two is very in, um, intentional and the students that might need a little extra support outside of those school wide interventions. Um, often those look like small group skill building early intervention and prevention services. And then we also went to work on building our mental health services within our school at the tier three level and those are the individual more intensive services. Um, these are some pictures of some of our events from our tier one um, events that have taken uh, place over the years, over the past three years. Um, we try and get out there as much as possible during lunchtime events, during fairs that they might have for students or parents. Um, we put billboards up and also construct lessons that the teachers um, play in their classrooms to the students. Developed um, advertisement materials for students so that it becomes easier to access wellness. We're in our third year now um, and we actually have some of those resources available to you all in the drive that Jenny shared in the chat feature. Um, and then Jenny, if you have a chance to um, relink that, hopefully everybody still has access to that. Um, but I'll reference a few of the resources and materials that we've um, put together and made available for all of you guys. Um, feel free to make copies and use them at your will. Um, because we are in a pandemic and a really, really crazy time, we saw a need to support teachers. And so we are increasing our supports and our system to provide resources and advocacy and self care resources um, and partner with Kaiser Permanente on how to support our teachers and how to give them stress management techniques to get through this really difficult time. We also created um, teacher information sessions that included things like supporting your child's mental health and wellness, um, understanding the statistics of suicide for adolescents in our country, um, and made those lessons available for, for parents to attend on a school-wide level. Um, this year, we went and dove into the task of creating a universal screening. Um, those of you that are MTSS superstars know that a universal screening is essential to doing tier work, uh, tier one work in schools. Um, a lot of the universal screenings out there, though, are deficit based, and so we decided to choose a strength based universal screening. Um, tool called CoVitality, um, and we decided to start small. Christina mentioned that we asked to start small for wellness centers, um, and we just kind of went all in with all of the seven schools, um, but we decided to kind of rein it back a little bit for the universal screenings to work out some of the bugs of what's working and what's not working and best practices, um, and so we started at our two alt-ed sites, um, Independence High School, and Adelante High School, which is our continuation high school in the district. On a tier two level, we did a lot of partnering with the ninth grade health teachers and classes to do advertisement of wellness, how students can access our wellness center just to take a five minute brain break, um, to come in and get a tea and chat with somebody, or how to ask for ongoing services. 
And then based off of the referrals that we had coming in, we started to build our capacity for the small groups um, that just weren't taking place on a school-wide, um, district-wide um, level. And so we wanted to be really mindful of what curriculum that we were building into our tier two interventions. Um, and each of our school sites has a wide range of curriculum available to all of our staff now. Um, I do get feedback from all of the interns every year of how impressed they are with our mm -hmm. curriculum that we have avail available for them to choose from and it can be kind of overwhelming but we wanted to focus mm -hmm. what curriculum we chose <clears throat> and focus on evidence-based um, curriculum and models and intervention and this is one because it aligns with an mtss framework um, and work that we're doing within schools but also we wanted to provide evidence-based effective models um, to kind of collect data and show kind of the importance of wellness and our mental health services that we're doing um, at each of our school levels. Um, and we are also for the tier three level um, individual services. We're using a thorough biopsychosocial assessment for each referral that we receive. Um, to help inform where the specific <clears throat> needs are for those students. Um, and then creating specific SMART goals to narrow down the work that needs to be done. And then choosing from our evidence-based curriculum models that we have to inform our practice and our tier three interventions so that we're providing um, effective services. We went from a model of providing just a tier three um, individual services to providing a whole spectrum of services on a school campus. So students are able to drop into our wellness centers, build relationships with our staff in there, take a five minute brain break. One of our highest needs is um, stress and anxiety that we're seeing in our referrals. Um, and we're getting a lot of feedback from students of how important it is just to take a pause and practice some mindfulness and use those um, soft welcoming um, areas of wellness centers um, to just get back to baseline. We provide um, check-ins, short counseling, and then kind of do the referrals to skill building, tier two intervention groups, as well as individual therapy. Um, we saw the need as well because we're providing such robust services in the school to be very smart and intentional, intentional to track our services that we're that we're providing. So for two reasons, one, it's really hard to keep track of. We had about 950 referrals last year throughout our whole school district. It's hard to keep track of all of those referrals, and so we created a system to track the referrals. This is um this screenshot that I have up here is our year three model of our tracker. Um, and it has come a long way since the year one model that we had. Um, this tracker also serves as a tool that we provide data um, and information to our school board, to our district office, our principals at our sites, as well as our parents and our students to kind of show the impact of the services that we're having um, for the students on site and the spectrum and breadth mm -hmm. of our breadth and depth of our work that we're doing. Our first year of wellness, we partnered with CSU Sacramento and they have been an amazing partner with us, um, supporting us to have uh, social workers, bachelor level social work interns, master level <clears throat> social work interns. And our first year we had a partnership with University of San Francisco. They have a branch out in Sacramento. Um, the second year and third year, we have we are continuing to expand our university pa partnerships. Um, Craig's going to talk a little bit more about what that looks like, but it's really enabled us to create multidisciplinary teams. Um, everything from bachelor level social workers to MSWs, uh, professional clinical counselors, um, individuals working on their pupil personnel service credentials, MFT trainees, um, and it's the spectrum. Um, our first year, because we kind of started small and each year has been expanding more and more, we started with um, about two or three staff at each of the school sites. Um, and some of the schools this year have six to eight staff. And so we are seeing the numbers expand and the number of students we're able to serve, partly because we are expanding our um, partnerships with universities and expanding our staff skill sets but also we're becoming more integrated within the whole school model. 
Um, we've tried to be really creative with our funding sources too for sustainability purposes. Um, Craig's going to talk a little bit more about this tobacco specific grant that we had the opportunity to apply for and we were accepted, but it had allowed us to have um, an increase of two staff. Um, and we have a potential for having a third staff being hired full time to provide tobacco prevention program at each of our schools. We also have a partnership with the PCOE, our Placer County Office of Education, um, which has allowed us three of our school sites in our district um, have two full time staff at each of the school sites um, that helps um, staff those drop in services, those tier one services and tier two services that we're providing to students um, uh, and families throughout the school. We wanted to be really intentional about the three coordinators um, and them hiring me on as well. They chose to have somebody that had a dual, not only clinical license, but also a school credential license so that we could have a wide spectrum of interns and staff that we could supervise. We can supervise interns from PPS credentials to social work interns and clinical staff because we hold both of those credentials. And we wanted to be really intentional about, again, going back to our systems that were already established in place. And so one of the things that was established was our intervention response team, um, where it looked at kind of the high needs, high risk, 504 students, students that need IEP um, assessment, students that are struggling to come to school. Um, and those teams consist of nurses, admin, counselors, special education staff. Um, and so we partnered with them to become an integrated piece of that system. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Craig. <clears throat> Thanks, Sabrina. Uh, so I just want to take a second and, and just ground us in this presentation and our time. Um, it's almost 11 o'clock. I'm, I'm going to talk about, um, maybe take up 15 minutes of time, and then um, we want to leave the last 15 minutes just for questions and answers. Um, and so if you, if you have questions, you can start feeding those into the chat, um, and we'll be monitoring those. <clears throat> um, Sabrina was talking about uh, <clears throat> collaborations um, and our, our district and school site collaborations. And what we know and we knew going into this work is that we were not going to be able to do it alone. Um, we anticipated um, the need and we knew that a lot of students would be accessing wellness supports. Um, so that first year, we did a lot of work around engaging our community and our community-based organizations <clears throat> in joining us on our wellness journey. Um, and being available to provide supports to students either who needed more intense levels level of, of services that we could provide at our school sites or if there were services that we weren't providing we had referral sources um, and a place to send those students and those families so i want to talk just a second about <clears throat> um, a few of our our community partnerships um, and how those work um, kids first um, is a nonprofit in our community um, and they've been a, a great resource for us um, they provide um, a myriad of services. Um, they do CalFresh enrollments. Um, they have some after school programs. Um, they can help folks with uh, PG &E discount, um, discounts and enrollments. Um, and they do Medi Cal um, application assistance. Um, and those aren't things that we really do at the school site. So they've been great in partnering with us around that. We furthered our partnership with them um, when they wrote a grant and included us in their grant, <clears throat> which provided um, our year one and year two with them. Um, is they actually have a staff person from Kids First who joined us on the school site to provide individual therapy for kids um, and to help us with some group support at our alternative ed site. Um, we also, um, with Kids First and part of the grant, was they gave us a case manager um, who was able to join our, res our response to intervention teams. And so if kids needed or families needed that warm handoff, um, they were actually able to come to our school, meet with the students, um, and then connect with them at their agency so that just to, re to decrease some of the stigma around accessing services in the community. So Kids First has been a great partnership and we can't do it without all of these partners. Um, the Lighthouse Counseling and Family Resource Center, um, we partner with them. Um, they do a lot of very similar work that we do, um, but they have an emphasis in bi bilingual services. And so some of our families that need that, we're able to access the Lighthouse <coughs> Resource Center and refer folks there. 
Um, we have a great partnership with um, the Placer Food Bank. Um, they've been very flexible um, with supporting the, the needs of our students. And we've had many occasions, and for some reason, it's always Friday at three o'clock that a kid um, lets somebody know that they're going to go home and they don't have food for the weekend. Um, and the Placer Food Bank has always been there. We can run to the food bank if we need to um, get enough food to see the family through the weekend and or sometimes through a couple weeks um, and provide that to, to the students and to families. Um, the food bank also provides holiday baskets um, and we've, we've um, in our collaboration with them, have been able to sign families up and give out hundreds of, of food baskets to kids that are in our school districts. Um, so that's a great resource. Uh, Granite Wellness is a substance abuse treatment program um, and they have also pushed onto our campuses and provided service directly to students at our schools. Um, and they're also a great referral source for kids who need a higher level of treatment around substance abuse. Um, they have an outpatient program, um, and so we're able to refer students there um, when they need that. Um, and then we have our county partnerships with our county office of education um, and just with our county health and human services and children's mental health. Um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that when we talk about um, funding. Uh, we have a triage grant um, with the county office um, that helps with that. But our, one of our other unique partnerships with our county office is um, they provide a lot of training. Um, they train, they use the applied suicide skills intervention training. They provide mental health um, first aid trainings. Um, they bring uh, motivational interviewing trainings to our county. Um, and Christina is an assist trainer. So in lieu of Christina joining with PCOE staff to do assist trainings throughout the county, we get to send all of our interns and trainees to those count to those trainings that PCOE offers for free. So it's a great collaboration. It's a win win for everybody. Um, and we also can send teachers to those trainings. Really anybody in our school district that that wants to be trained in those things um, is able to go to those trainings for free. Um, so that is a, That's a great partnership that we have with our county. Um, <clears throat> um, and with our, our county mental health as well. I'm going to touch on that more in a little bit. Um, Christina or Sabrina mentioned our partnerships with um, our universities, local universities. Um, and these partnerships have been um, amazing in that uh, you're going to see some numbers in a second on, on, on how we've really increased the service that we provide to students. And we can't do that without, without a labor force. Um, and so we've, we've developed an intern or trainee program um, that goes beyond just having trainees and interns on our on our campuses. Um, they really are integrated into our wellness centers. We spend a lot of time training and working with our with our um, our interns. Um, we do a three day a full three day orientation um, at the beginning of every school year to really get them grounded in the work that they're going to be doing um, and getting them prepared for training. Um, most of us that work in schools know, you know, that first couple weeks of school, um, there's not too much going on. Kids are integrating into the school. They're doing their classes. Um, so we also take advantage of those first two weeks to, to really shore people up in, in the biopsychosocial that Sabrina talked about, the attendance work that our BSWs do in supporting students and training them in our attendance support plan. And so it's, it's just really important when you bring on interns is to make sure that they're trained and that we feel comfortable providing, having them provide service directly to our students. Sabrina also mentioned that we, um, the three of us are licensed and so we're able to provide clinical supervision. We do that mostly through group. Um, and so weekly supervision happens with all of our clinical folks. Um, and those that are working towards licensure, um, we provide individual supervision as well um, to make sure that they have a good grasp on what they're doing. Um, we also, with our, with our trainee program, um, uh, we align that with our themed months. And so we're training folks um, in different modalities of working with students. Uh, next month, we're gonna be training in DBT. And so we'll be taking a deep dive with folks into our, to the DBT model um, and how that functions at a school site. Uh, <clears throat> So everything, um, everything that we've talked about so far um, is great, and we feel really fortunate to get to do this work. Um, but a lot of folks often ask, well, how do you pay for it? Um, and so I'm going to talk, spend a little bit of time talking about how we fund our wellness centers. Um, the bulk of our wellness centers are paid for through our LCAP um, and through a local control funding formula. Um, and <clears throat> um, 
we've looked at three different areas um, in our LCAP to kind of ground that funding in, and that's conditions of learning. Um, and so we're really looking at our conditions of learning for, for students optimal. And if there's things around mental health or social emotional needs, um, can we help with those so that they can better benefit from their academics and their education? And so we put fun, funding around there. Engagement, student and parent engagement is an issue. Um, as most of you know, in schools, sometimes it's challenging to engage parents um, and, and joy, having them join our school communities. And so we do a lot of outreach. Um, again, with our themed months, we always provide um, trainings for parents around anxiety, um, around vaping. Um, and so we're engaging parents and coming in and getting um, more training or, and or education themselves. Um, and we, we have um, fairly decent turnout with parents who wanna come um, and engage around those social, emotional and mental health issues. Um, and then the last area through the LCAP is pupil outcomes. Um, really looking at the outcomes and our is what we're, is what we're doing with wellness having um, the effect that we want it to have. Um, and one of the outcome areas that we're focusing on is really looking at um, our minority students um, and making sure that that we're serving them at a proportional level. So that's one way we fund our our uh, wellness centers. We also use Title One dollars to fund those. Um, we do a lot of grant writing. Um, I write grants for our homeless education um, through CDE, um, and we've gotten the homeless grant um, for the last three years. Um, so that's another funding source. Uh, we've created a needs assessment that we use throughout our wellness centers um, to meet with students living in transitional or homeless situations so that we can better serve them and resource them. Um, uh, it was mentioned that we have the Tobacco Use Prevention Education Grant or the TUPI grant. Um, we've gotten two of those grants. Um, it allows for us to have extra staff. Um, one of the things we wrote into that grant was stipends for teachers. Um, we have um, Club Fave, um, Fight Against Vape. Um, and so we have teachers who are um, club advisors and we're able to stipend them through that grant to get the teachers involved on the ground level of helping students who are vaping um, and want to quit vaping um, and to help raise awareness on our campuses. Um, we also have um, our triage grant, which is with our Placer County Office of Education and our Children's System of Care. Um, the, the triage grant, like Sabrina said, funds six additional positions on three of our school sites. And so we have our mental health associates who are folks that are either licensed or working towards licensure. Um, and then we also get community liaisons who are full-time folks um, working on our campuses to um, engage the community um, and help folks um, uh, engage in the, the community providers that we talked about. Um, along with that, um, it's not just PCOE, but it is our county mental health, children's mental health that's involved in that. So we have a direct line um, to our county. Um, and we have folks that come to our meetings that are, are part of the children's system of care. And so that collaboration becomes essential when, when kids are involved with child protective services or accessing children's mental health or higher levels of, of care through our county. And we're able to, um, to, to a certain degree, share um, educationally related information about those students to best serve them at our schools. Um, some of the smaller grants that we've done, Christina's great at hustling our community. Um, she applied for an Adventist health grant, um, which you can see in that picture, um, some furniture. Um, we got 10,000 bucks from Adventist, um, and we, we spent that on furniture to make our space um, feel really comfortable and warm for kids. Um, Christina also wrote a grant for Rayleigh's, um, and so that we're able to have, um, we purchased um, hot water uh, canisters or machines for our wellness centers. Um, and tea and snacks, um, and we got that through a grant from Rayleigh's. Um, and we continue to get their support so that we can have kids um, have tea, feel comfortable, and have a snack when they need it. Um, and I think that leads us to our next slide, which is <clears throat> um, the space. Um, it's one of the things that our district was really gracious with when we started this journey. Um, I, I, I think back to that first year and walking around with school administrators at each of the school sites, identifying what's an appropriate and good space for kids to use and for a place for us to build the wellness centers. Um, and we really wanted space um, that was big enough um, that kids could come in and relax. We also needed rooms that were attached to provide individual therapy. As you can imagine, confidential space is hard to come by on a school site. 
Um, we do the best that we can. Some of our space is not completely confidential. We've got white noisemakers and we do the best that we can. Um, but we also have group space that's available to us and meeting and training space. Um, and all of that is important um, and really creating safety for students. So when they come into the wellness center, they know it's a safe space where they can be. Um, there is always somebody available to them in the wellness center if they need um, someone to talk to, um, or if they just wanna chill out and listen to their music for five or 10 minutes to take, um, to take a break from class, they're able to do that. Uh, to help us kind of structure and organize, um, this last year we put a team together who developed and we developed a website um, really as a resource um, for our staff, our wellness staff, but also as a resource for our school community. Um, and you'll have access to this website. I believe it's in the, um, uh, the link is in the packet that, that you received. Um, and the website is really around resources. Um, there's resources in here for students, there's resources for parents, there's resources for our school staff, our teachers um, and other school staff, um, especially through this time of COVID when they need extra support as well. Um, and then we use this as a resource for our wellness center staff. Um, uh, also, what might be interesting is I talked a little bit about our intern program, um, but we use this when we're recruiting interns. Um, and so interns can, um, can scout us to see if it's a place that they want to be. Um, and then that intern tab, it really gives a more detailed description of what we offer to interns um, in that collaborative process. Uh, one of our, what are we doing with time? I have about five more minutes. Okay. Uh, one of the things we used um, or looked for in the beginning was um, we wanted to know where we should put our energy in the beginning. Um, and we, we did a lot of research looking for a rubric or guiding document when we started our wellness center. Um, and we didn't find one, so we created one. Um, and so this is available to you. Um, it's, a, it's a rubric that you can use to help determine where you should put your energy when you start a wellness center. Um, and these were the areas that we thought were important um, in starting a wellness center was the physical space, your processes and procedures, what interventions you're going to use or have available to you, your community partnerships, your integration and collaboration of how you do this within a school system, staffing that you'll need, um, taking into account at all times school culture, um, and then what was our assessment and valuation process. We use this rubric to really guide where are we with implementing all of these areas or these domains within our wellness center. Um, and we use this on a yearly basis to see if we need to write goals for ourselves so that we can continually improve um, the implementation of our wellness centers. So I'm just gonna share um, some numbers with you so that you can see where we're at with our wellness centers and how quickly things have ramped up over three years. Um, our, that first year, um, we had 292 tier two and tier three services. So individual and our group, kids needing individual or group services, we had about 292 kids that came through the door um, that we evaluated, assessed, and provided those services to. Um, year two, we took a big jump to 625. Um, last year, we served um, over 900 students um, with tier two and tier three services. And looking at our numbers this year, um, we're, going to, we're going to continue to climb um, and provide service to more kids, um, probably over a thousand students this year. Um, other data points, um, and I think it's important to know too through our MTSS process that, that data drives what we do. Um, Sabrina is amazing at creating ways to capture data. Um, when students come into our wellness centers, um, when they enter the door, they sign in and they identify why they're there and what they need um, from the wellness center support and from the staff. And so in the upper left-hand corner, you can see um, why kids are, are uh, coming into the wellness center. Um, over 30% of them just need to take a break. They just need a safe place to be. Um, and other ones, and you can see the other reasons. Um, and so really kids come for various reasons. There's also what grade levels. Across the board, all the kids come. It doesn't matter what grade they're in. Um, and then you can see on the right hand side, uh, that data piece is the, the types of services that we provided to students. And so really identifying what kids are coming in for. Um, and so that we, so that we know when we're looking for our evidence-based practices, where we should put our energy and where we should train staff. 
the next slide that you're going to see in a second <clears throat> is um, a piece of information that we thought was relevant to the work that we've been doing over the past three years. Um, and just looking at um, our California Healthy Kids survey data, um, as well as our yearly data, um, and how kids are presenting, um, uh, specifically looking at our non-traditional students or our students that are in, in uh, alternative education. Um, and, and those questions on the left about feeling sad um, um, and or seriously consider suicide uh, have gone down over the years. So another data point to look at. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Sabrina, um, <clears throat> and she's going to talk about how you can access the resources that we've talked about and that we've put together for our wellness centers. Thank you. And there's some great questions in the chat that we are going to get to in a second and how we do have some time left over for all of that. So again, um, on the left here is a link. You can use the bit.ly link of um, typing that into the, your Google search, which will take you to our website. Or if you have a smartphone, you can take out the camera feature on your smartphone and just hold it up to that little um, pixelated black and white square where it says scan me and a little bar will pop up at the top. If you just click that bar, it'll take you right to our website. This is also a way in which we've advertised for students um, throughout the school on how to submit self referrals, how to submit a request for help. Um, and so we're starting to integrate that into um, flyers and um, advertising our wellness centers at our school sites. Over here on the right hand side is a bit.ly of where you can find our um, folder that Jenny put at the in our chat box, but this is just another way in which you can find that and it has all of those resources around our referrals um, our tracking. It has our brochure on there um, and any other kind of resources that were mentioned throughout our presentation. So with that, I am going to open it up for questions and answers. Um, and I will actually give the floor back over. How do you guys want to do this? We'll over to, okay. You take the first one. So the first question says, is the collaboration meeting with the county children's system a recurring meeting? If so, how are you determining who should be at those meetings? So I'm going to take a wild stab at this and say that this question really is about HIPAA and FERPA. <laughs> um, and that has definitely been a challenge for us is really um, navigating um, the HIPAA FERPA confidentiality um, issues when we have um, outside providers coming on to school. So because um, so through our triage grants, um, our PCOE folks, our Placer County Office of Education, so they're, they're education employees. So they fall under FERPA as well as we do. And so we can chat with them even though they're not employed by our school district. Um, so we've made that determination. Our children's system of care folks, um, they come to our staff meetings. And so um, we, have, we have two different meetings um, in our wellness centers. One is a staff meeting with the wellness folks um, where we talk about kids in a more general or broad sense and more around process and procedures and how we're addressing the needs of students. And then in our intervention response team meetings, we talk more about the clinical needs or issues that um, are brought up with kids and how we're going to address those through the wellness center. So our county office folks aren't usually at or our uh, children's system of care folks aren't usually at our IRT meetings, um, but they do help us with the processes um, and how we how we structure those meetings um, and they bring their their expertise to that, uh, but not necessarily getting all the, um, the The names of students and the interventions that we're using. Next question. Next question is how do you connect the work of wellness centers and schools with the work of removing police and SROs from schools, if at all. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So I feel I feel really fortunate in our school district and I think Christina and Sabrina at their school sites would agree. Our SROs are amazing. Um, we've we've got really great school resource officers. Um, I know the ones that I work with. I always um, I always say they function more like social workers than they do cops. Um, and so I think we just have have felt really fortunate. Um, they also collaborate with us. Um, we use our officers a lot when we have students, when we're doing risk assessments and we have suicidal students and, and we need to get students to, um, to a facility for further evaluation. 
where we're more a collaborative partner with them and they follow our lead quite often around on what we think needs to happen for students. Um, or if they make a determination that a student needs to be hospitalized, we're there to support the student as they're going through that process. Do you want to talk about the FMT yeah. and homeless liaison? Yeah. Um, one of the pieces I forgot to mention when we talked about um, the triage grant and our collaboration with the county office and with Children's System of Care is part of that grant um, was written in was to create a, um, a, a mobile crisis team. Um, and so for the last, we're in our second year and there's a mobile crisis team that serves um, our, the city of Roseville. Um, and so when students are in crisis or at risk, they will come to our school site and do the, do the 5150 um, evaluation. And if they determine those students need to be hospitalized, that team is amazing at getting an ambulance there or we're collaborating with parents or, or with law enforcement to ensure that the student get to the hospital. Um, and then that team um, will take the next 30 days and follow up with that family to make sure that they're plugged into the community. As well, that team, if families are just struggling, it's not just around risk assessment, they actually will go to the family's home if, if they need support in other areas to address family dynamic issues um, and provide support to the family and get them connected to the community. All right, the next question is, um, has it been challenging to find candidates that have dual license? I think there was maybe some misunderstanding <laughs> around our role versus like yeah. staff. Yeah. Um, Honestly, there is some challenges there. Uh, uh, like we said in our introduction, we're the three coordinators are licensed clinical social workers, and we have people personnel services credentials um, to do school social work. Um, and so at the level of coordinator, that's our requirement. Um, the three of us love our jobs so much that we haven't left, so we haven't come up with that. But some of our partners um, in looking to find folks that are licensed with the PPS credential, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's hard. Um, there are not a lot of us out there. Um, I think one of the challenges is that oftentimes we use MFTs, uh, trainees, um, and we can also use MFT um, folks that are working towards licensure to be our mental health associates. So you don't have to be a social worker and you don't have to have a PPS um, to work in our schools and really be that face of our wellness center. Um, we, we have a, uh, quite a few folks that are actually um, marriage and family therapists or trainees working towards that license. So I hope that answered that question. How are you using school nurses in your model? Yeah, our school nurses are definitely part of our model. They've been there since the beginning with us. They were part of our implementation team. Um, we use our nurses a lot, um, really just to help uh, or help support um, one of the key areas is some of our students um, uh, are on medications. And so we wanna ensure that our school nurse is aware of those medications and that we're treating kids appropriately at school um, if they need meds administered or anything like that. Um, and just to share information around um, uh, students who need extra support more with physical health than necessarily mental health um, and helping, helping kids get connected to our school nurse. And uh, at some of our sites, they're also part of our um multidisciplinary team, our intervention response team. So they're an integral part of what we do. Uh, the next question is, um, when you assess or evaluate tier for tier two or tier three services, how are you completing this? So I'm gonna talk about our triage form. Yeah, so we integrated this year. Um, Ooh, let me, let me, give, I'm gonna put a little, uh, a little history to that. So uh, when we first started, our referrals came from school counselors. Um, we decided to limit because we didn't know how big this was going to be. So that first year we limited referrals for services and they had to go through the kids school counselor. Um, and as a part of that referral process, um, we, let, we let counselors, um, I'm sorry, assistant principals also could make those referrals. Um, we let them uh, indicate to us what they thought the service was that the kid needed. Um, we realized over time that we were asking folks that, that um, some folks that don't have the same mental health training that we do um, to indicate service. Um, so we have implemented a triage form that Sabrina is adding to the packet that you guys will have access to. So we now use a triage form that our mental health associates do on every kid that's referred. And through that triage process um, and, and brief interview with the student um, and or student and parents, um, and referring party, through that brief interview, we determine um, if the kid needs individual services, group services, more case management. Um, sometimes we use our BSWs as mentors. Um, and so through that triage form, that's how we're, we're deciding what service the student might need. 
In light of the HIPAA and FERPA presentation that some participants saw yesterday, how are you handling consent and what is shared? Yeah, great question. Um, and again, uh, if you're starting a wellness center, these are some really rich conversations that we had with our teams. Um, and when I say rich, um, I mean not easy. Um, <laughs> they, were, they were really challenging conversations about how we're going to do this. Um, and one of the issues that, that comes up a lot is um, when you're licensed, we're governed by the BBS as well as our employer. Um, and so it's, it's working through um, the challenges of that and coming to consensus about how you're going to do things. Um, so because we're employed by the district, um, we all fall under FERPA. Um, and so we, we can share information um, if it's educationally, if there's educational interest, and we do that. Um, but we don't do that in a way where we're sharing um, everything. We share what people need to know um, to best support the student and to benefit from their education. Um, and so that's, that's part of the training that when we bring our therapists on, that's part of the training that we put them through is sharing information. Um, the other piece is that is, is we do have kids, our parents sign consent for treatment. Um, and so everybody that's getting individual or group therapy, um, there's a consent form that we use and they're, they're consenting to that treatment. Um, as well, students, um, if need be, students can minor consent to treatment. Um, and this, there's challenges with that. Um, I'm not going to, to try and lie to anybody. There's challenges with minor consent. Um, and we do our best with minor consent and um, providing that privacy um, and access to service for kids who need it um, and need a, a higher level of privacy around that. Um, next question is, how have you adjusted your services during the pandemic and distance learning? <laughs> the best we can. <laughs> um, uh, um, so we really early on, um, um, our, our director gave us a heads up before we went into distance learning back in March that um, that it was going to go this direction. So we were able to gear up pretty quickly. Um, we were at that time in March before we went into distance learning. Um, we were running groups and doing individual therapy. Um, uh, and I'm going to say that one of our school mental health associates that did it the best um, got her kids prepared for that and said, let's do it over Zoom. So we quickly transitioned to, um, to doing virtual or telehealth um, with a lot of our students, um, and we've continued to do that. Um, we had enough support over summer that we were able to provide support for students um, over summer. Um, and we've continued into the school year with providing um, telehealth services to students. Was that the whole question? Yeah, yeah. We are all, uh, we're also providing group services on Zoom, um, and we did a lot and have been doing a lot of porch visits. So we're social distancing, wearing masks, and going to um, visit students at their homes. Um, so we're being as creative as possible. We're, we're going to a hybrid model on Monday, um, and like Craig said, our space is limited, and so what we're able to do socially distance but supporting students. Uh, we're, we, we got donations of, for lawn chairs and we're, we're doing a lot of services in um, different spaces on campus that are somewhat confidential but where we can safely distance with our students. Um, the last question is, can you talk more about the intervention response team? How are teams selected? Are there sure. recurring meetings? And how did you get buy-in from staff? So Sabrina, just let me know that I only have two minutes to answer that question. <laughs> so I'm gonna address the buy-in from staff. Again, this goes back to year one and our, our wellness implementation team and really front-loading that entire team with what a, an intervention response team um, should look like. Um, and that's a progression. Um, and I can tell you that we're not all where we want to be with that. Um, it's, it's really working with our school folks the best that we can to get there. Um, so we use evidence, you know, uh, we try and use data as best we can to drive our intervention response teams. Um, the people that come to those teams, it varies from school site to school site. Um, like uh, uh, Christina mentioned, oftentimes the nurse will come or we invite them when we need them and they will come. Um, our school counselors are there. Um, we have an administrator who's over counseling and wellness present at those. Um, other administrators are happy to join if there's a student they want to bring to the team. Um, we have our mental health associates that also participate in those teams. Um, and I want to say that at times, um, through our collaboration with uh, Kids First, if we knew case management was going to come up or we needed a warm handoff, we would invite them just for that student um, and we'd bring them into the team. Um, those are really quick um, 
quick meetings. Those happen fast. Um, I think one of the key is keys to those meetings is determining how much time you're going to spend talking about students. It's really easy to spend 30 minutes talking about one student. If you're doing that, it's not a very effective IRT team because those are hour long meetings and you have 20 kids to get through. Um, time management and good facilitation is key to um, a really good IRT. And the IRT model is based out of PBIS and the tier two teaming model. Um, so we try and use the, the tips form and utilize that model for it. Um, we just want to thank you guys. Thank you for participating. Please reach out. Our contacts are in um, are in uh, on our website. So please reach out if you need anything. Um, it, this was a hard journey, but we're glad we did it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.